good morning, church, and welcome to worship. My name is Pastor Greg, and I get to serve this community of Brownsville United Methodist Church. And we are glad that you are here with us today to lift up our voices, to sing praises to our God. Today is actually the fourth Sunday now in the season of Lent. And so for the past three weeks and, and all the way until Easter, we've been, we've been journeying with Jesus and with the disciples closer and closer each week to the cross and to the empty tomb which awaits us. So you are invited in on that journey, no matter if you've been worshiping with us or, or this is your first time, you are invited in on the journey. Uh, and, and to make sure that you can, can participate well, I want you to know that uh, all of the words to our hymns and our songs and, and our prayer responses, which we use occasionally throughout the service, will all be uh, here on the screen for you. If you'd like, you can also access a few more resources um, on our website or uh, in the comments section that include a, a connect card. We'd love to know that you are here and in a bulletin if you enjoy following through step by step. But above all, we are glad that you are here and we are glad that God has been calling us in throughout the entire week to, to hear from God and to respond from God. So let's do that now, brothers and sisters, siblings in Christ. Let's, let's worship holy God. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Before we were born, before we took our first breath, before the week started, before the year started, before we said, I love you, before we said, I'm sorry. Before we figured out who we really are. Before we figured out who we want to be. Before it all, God loved us. Unconditionally and freely, fully and honestly, God loved us. Again and again, this is where our story begins. Let us worship God.
This morning, our scripture reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so must the human one be lifted up, so that everyone who believes in him will have eternal life. God so loved the world that he gave his only son, so that everyone who believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. God didn't send his son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. This is the basis for judgment. The light came into the world, and people love darkness more than the light, for their actions are evil. All who do wicked things hate the light and don't come to the light for fear that their actions will be exposed to the light. Whoever does the truth comes to the light so that it can be seen that their actions were done in God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray, church. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, to whom all desires are known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. We pray that as we come to hear a word from you, that you would speak to us. For we, your servants, are listening. We pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts would be pleasing to you and bring you all honor and glory. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. John chapter 3, verse 16. Perhaps one of the best known verses in all of the Bible. No? Because this verse is so well known, I want to start today with a question. I want to ask you to ponder with me for a moment what associations or memories you have with this particular verse. So take just a moment and think on that with me. Maybe if you're watching on YouTube, feel free to, to write it in the chat and other people who are watching can, can see your reflections as well. What associations or memories do you have with this verse? For me, when I read John 3.16, I can't help but be transported back in time to Vacation Bible School at Calvary United Methodist Church in Wichita, Kansas, where every morning before the day's activities, my pastor would get up before the group and, and lead us in a song. First, you had to warm up your hands like this, because there's some clapping involved. And the song goes like this. We love... Because God first loved us, we love. Because God first loved us, we love. We love. We love. Because God first loved us. <laughs> A fun song. <laughs> and, it, and it speaks to the feature of John 3.16 that's considered by many to be one of the summative statements of the entire story of Scripture, a story that at its core tells of God's great love for us. Today, I want to take us back to John 3.16 to look and see how this wonderful summative statement is actually part of a much larger story. A larger story that begins with a Jewish leader named Nicodemus coming to Jesus under the cover of night. 
Now, Nicodemus, a Jewish leader, if he wasn't there in the temple courtyards to personally witness Jesus flipping the tables of the money changers and driving out the sacrificial animals. If he wasn't there, you can bet that he would have heard it through the grapevine. And so it it, it makes sense that after such a disruption to the status quo that was maintained by the sacrificial system, Well, it perhaps doesn't make sense, but it's curious, perhaps, we could say, that this Jewish leader would then come to Jesus, seek him out in the middle of the night to explore his wanderings and to satisfy his curiosity. Nicodemus, like us sometimes, gets hyper-focused on the logistics of being born again. He says out loud, how can anyone be born again after having grown old? It just doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And it especially doesn't make a lot of sense when it's divorced from the sacrificial system, the apple cart that Jesus, again, just disrupted in our text from last week. Jesus' response to Nicodemus' worry and confusion He responds with a monologue. Don't you love that? (laughs) There's this dialogue going on between Jesus and Nicodemus, and then Jesus kind of pulls the car aside and says, Listen here, Nicodemus. (laughs) Jesus responds in our text for today, verses 14 through 21. But before the big 316, the big John 316, there's, there's two verses before then, and it's worth looking at them. Verses 14 and 15. It's an allusion to a rather obscure Old Testament story about deadly serpents. And allow me to sort of peel back the layer and and tell this story because it's not super well known. If you have your Bible and you're curious, you can flip to, to Numbers 21. Uh, where this story takes place. And it begins with a familiar cast of characters. We know them. Moses leading the grumbling Israelites. <laughs> the Israelites are somewhere in between slavery in Egypt and crossing the River Jordan into the Promised Land when they become increasingly impatient again with both God and Moses. They wonder aloud, God, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? In Egypt, at least, we had food to eat and water to drink, so so long as we kept making those bricks for the Egyptians. And then the story goes in response to the Israelites' lack of trust. The Lord sends poisonous serpents among the people. And the serpents bite the people, and and some of them die. Hmm. It's kind of a troubling story, but that's not the end of it. When the Israelites repent and and say to Moses and and to God, hey, we know that we were were grumbling, We're, we're, we're sorry, the Lord tells Moses to make a bronze serpent just like the ones that were doing the biting. And he tells Moses to to put that bronze serpent on a pole and and to hold it up high so that those who had been bitten could see the serpent. And once they saw the serpent being held on the pole, they would be healed. Kind of an an obscure story, right? But it's worth digging up this obscure story because when the first readers of John read this gospel account, their eyes weren't fixed to John 3.16 like ours are. Their eyes were fixed to 14 and and 15 and the allusion to the bronze serpent because that was the story that they knew. Except in this version, Nicodemus is the stand-in for the people of Israel who are unable to 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 fully receive God's love which had been given to them. Jesus stands in for the serpent, the one who is to be nailed to a wooden cross and exalted 
for all the world to see. And it's this refusal, this inability to fully receive the gift of God's love, which is freely given, uh, that's worth zeroing in on a little bit. Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan priest, says the reason that we, like the Israelites and Nicodemus, struggle to fully embrace the freely given gift of God's love is because free gifts say nothing about being strong, about being superior or moral. In, in other words, it's hard for us to justify being recipients of something that we don't deserve. Maybe that sounds a little more familiar. Now, Rohr calls this the economy of merit. And watch out, because it's the economy of merit which, perv which persists and pervades every part of, of our culture today. It, it's the economy of merit that says a single mother working a minimum wage job shouldn't make a living wage because she hasn't earned it yet or hasn't climbed her way through the ranks. It's the economy of merit that makes you feel bad about asking your boss for time off. It's the economy of merit which suggests that, contrary to what the law actually says, black and brown men are to be considered guilty until proven innocent, until they are proven to be good and moral according to a system that would rather see them suffer. One final example, it's the economy of merit that would conflate God's holy church with a business that sole mission is to sell the right products in order to attract the right buyers, which then and only then will allow the church to grow and serve God in the community. The economy of merit is everywhere. It's everywhere, and it's truly as old as Egypt, as the saying goes. Because this is the same selfish system that the Israelites were steeped in while enslaved in Egypt for 400 years. For them, it was simple. You got food and you got water, depending on how many bricks you made. Maybe you would know someone who knew someone and you could get a little extra for a family member or a friend who was sick or who couldn't work. And truly, the economy of merit is one that prefers this worldview, one of scarcity and quid pro quos where it's the clever ones and the ones with access who, who get to thrive. But church, if there's one thing that I really believe in my blood and guts today is that God does not want this economy of scarcity for God's people. We know this because in the Exodus event, God frees the Israelites from, from the economy of merit in Egypt and invites them into another way of being, into what Roar calls the economy of grace, the economy of of love. And it's here in the economy of love where God's, God's self is freely given to the Israelites and to, and to all. As Moses leads them out into the wilderness, they would find that God would make more than enough manna fall from the heavens to eat. God would make more than enough water flow from that rock for them to drink. And they would even receive the law, the Ten Commandments, which to us might seem stifling and like a, a list of you know, legalistic rules. But for the Israelites, this was um, the guide, the roadmap to living truly free lives with God, as opposed to living under the rule of Pharaoh. So you can see now, perhaps, we can see now, perhaps, that in Numbers 21, this story is loaded with more than just a few untimely grumblings. No, what it represents is a 180-degree 
pivot away from the economy of God's grace and, and back towards the economy of merit, which God had freed them from. Now, you probably thought this was a sermon about John 3.16, and it is. <laughs> but like we've already said, there's more to John 3.16 than John 3.16. And the author of John wants this to be true for us too. Otherwise, um, I don't think he would have put in this illusion here for us. And so with the stories of the Israelites and Nicodemus as our guide, our souls um, can begin to approach a deep truth that our minds alone cannot comprehend. A deep truth that only our souls can begin to grasp. And this truth is the economy of God's grace, which we are invited into. A free gift of God's love given to us in Jesus Christ, something we did not earn, something we did nothing in exchange for. Just consider for a moment how, how rare that is today. Everything you get and receive, it's because you, you worked for it or you paid for it. Very rarely are we in a posture like this. Hands open to receive a gift. Very rarely. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that God gave his only son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Now, this, this verse, this passage talks a lot about faith, too. For God so loved the world that God gave his only son so that, there's a so that, so that all who believe in the son may not perish but have eternal life. Sounds a lot like the serpent on the pole to me. That all who see, that all who believe will not perish but truly live. God's love and our faith. It's kind of like the theological equivalent of which came first, the chicken or the egg. <laughs> the economy of merit would say that our faith comes first. Believe and you will be saved. If only you can have enough faith to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, then all the treasures in heaven are yours. That might be what the economy of merit says. But what I want to suggest to you today, what I want to be sure that you hear today is the economy of grace that is as old as Egypt that says God loved first. For God so loved the world. God loved first. And it is because that God loved us first that we are freed like the Israelites, like, like, like Nicodemus, to return that love back to God and to our neighbors. So friends, don't get me wrong. Faith is a critical component of what life with God looks like. Faith is a critical part of our Christian experience. And for too long, it has been wielded as a weapon to exclude those who struggle to believe, those who have no faith. And so whether you have some faith, no faith, or you need to borrow some faith, <laughs> hear the good news that God loves you first. God loves us first. Hmm. I'm going on for a while now here about God's love. 
and how it comes first. There should probably be another sermon down the line soon about faith, and, and we'll get there, but how about hearing just that message for now? For God so loved the world. I think it's best summed up in a song that I learned long ago. <laughs> Sing it with me if you can. We love because God first loved us. We love because God first loved us. We love, we love, we love because God first loved us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. May it be so. Amen. Church, I think I have said it more than once so far today, so uh, maybe one more won't hurt. <laughs> and that is that God's love is a gift that we have received. Thanks be to God. As we continue in worship as a people who have received love, God calls us to also give love. To love because God first loved us. 
And one way that we do that is by offering to God our time, our talents, um, our financial resources, and our witness. There are many ways to give back and to give gifts of love. If you feel called today to give um, a financial gift to support the ministry and mission of Brownsville United Methodist Church, we would be grateful. And you can do that in a variety of ways. You can send in a physical contribution to our church address. You can use the church address to set up an automatic bill pay through your financial institution or go to our website and you can set up and manage your own one-time and recurring contributions through our secure online giving partner, Tithely. The amount is not as important as the prayer, as the gift, as the response to the love that we have received so freely. So let's respond, church, with, with joy and with thanksgiving. O God, all that we have, all that we are, is already yours. These tithes and offerings which we share with you today are a way of keeping us focused not on the things that would take life, but will renew our lives. Hope, love, compassion, empathy, among others. As the Israelites looked to a serpent on a pole for healing, we look towards a Savior on a cross to be brought back to life. And it is in that holy name, the name of Jesus, in which we pray. Amen. Well, church, as we continue now in prayer and in worship, I invite you to join me. Brownsville United Methodist Church is a fellowship committed to praying for and with one another in a variety of ways. And one way we do that on Sunday morning is by using a prayer response. So as I pray, you'll occasionally hear me say the words, Lord, in your mercy, and you're invited to respond with the entire congregation with the words, hear our prayer. So Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer our prayer. You got it. Let's pray. O oh, gracious and merciful, loving God, we come searching for you in the night, just like Nicodemus did. We come looking for you because we have forgotten the beginning of our story that we were made from love, to be love, and to give love. Instead of rooting our narrative in the goodness refrain of creations, we, we too often skip ahead and find our worth at the fall, with Cain and Abel lost in the wilderness. We forget that first there was you, and in you, Blessed triune God is love. You created us out of this love. And from the very first day, you have not turned away from us. We forget because a love like that doesn't make sense. Hmm. 
A love like that doesn't make sense. And so we give you so much thanks for this love that refuses to let us go. And we pray, O oh God, help us to be more confident in your love for us, to be more confident in our love for ourselves, and to be more bold in how we love each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As we continue into the next chapters of our life together, as Brownsville United Methodist Church, we pray for the resolve to never forget this past year, to never forget those who have known death from the COVID-19 virus. We pray for all those who have lost their lives and their families. We pray for those who are currently sick, who are recovering, and those who will still get sick before we see an end to this. We pray for the overall trends that we see to continue. That's our desire. We want to see cases continue to go down and vaccine distribution continue to go up. We pray with special care for vaccine distribution that equity would prevail so that all who want and need a vaccine would be able to do so, regardless of who they are, their socioeconomic status, or their medical history. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those of special concern to our community, including those in need of healing. We continue to pray for Dennis. For Eleanor, a mother who is having mobility issues. For Paul. For Mark. For a friend who is suffering from a persistent stomach ailment. And another friend who is grieving the return of cancer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. O oh God, although we may feel a little sleepy this morning and in the days to come, we muster up a prayer of thanksgiving for the suddenly longer days and the promise of more sunshine and flourishing gardens to come. As we draw nearer towards the empty tomb, reveal yourself to us, God, we pray. Reveal yourself in these everyday places that we too may grow in grace and in love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are working for justice around the world, including protests happening in Louisville to lament one year without justice for the murder of your beloved daughter, Brianna Taylor. We mourn with Brianna's family and all those who grieve the loss of loved ones today. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. There are so many other prayers, O oh God, that you have given to us. So church, I invite you now to lift these prayers to God, either silently aloud as the Lord may lead um, there in your home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So now, church, with the confidence of God's beloved, let us say the prayer that the Lord taught his disciples as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, church, as we prepare now to, to be sent as those marked by God's love for us. I want to give my, my thanks to, to Jane for her beautiful music today, for her beautiful prelude and, and for the postlude, which is, which is yet to come. I encourage you to, to stick around and to listen to that. Um, to do, I, I think, give thanks to Sue and to, to Duena and to Noli and all the folks behind the scenes who have helped make these worship celebrations possible. I also would like to invite you to, to two opportunities coming up. One is um, our weekly time of fellowship um, right after the service. Well, depending on when you're watching this, but at 11 a.m. Pacific time. And you can find that Zoom link in the comments or at our website. And we'd love to see you and, and to say hi and check in. And then also um, coming up on Wednesday of this coming week, uh, we have an evening prayer service at 7 p.m. also on Zoom. And there we will receive Holy Communion as a community. So, so join via your computer, join on the phone if you need to. We'd love to have you there. There's a lot of other things to be excited about in the life of Brownsville United Methodist Church. God is, is doing some really exciting things in this community, including the, the still half-finished wall um, behind me. We're, we're working on that, absolutely. Um, so just keep, keep in tuned to, to the emails and the Thursday Thoughts announcements um, so you can find a way to plug in an opportunity to serve. I think that's all that I need to say at this point. Um, I invite you now to receive this benediction, this Lenten benediction, which we've been using throughout our Lenten journey. And again, it comes, it is written by Joanna Harder. And so receive this now. Friends, whatever wilderness the Spirit brings you to, Walk in boldness as a beloved child of God. Walk in peace under the shelter of the Most High. Walk in faith knowing that Christ walks with you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And amen. Go in peace, church, to love and to serve the Lord to serve our neighbors. Go in peace.